morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and I guess good evening, everyone. I uh, hope yeah. you can all hear me now. Uh, my name is Howard Mann, and I'll be moderating this webinar uh, today. Um, and as you know from the uh, invitations, uh, the two featured speakers today are Natalie Bernasconi Osterwalder, uh, Natalie Bernasconi to most of us. Uh, she is the group director of the Economic Law and Policy Division at ISD um, and uh, has been managing the investment program for 10 years now, um, almost 10 years. Uh, as well as the other economic law and policy elements. Uh, and with Natalie is Professor Rob House. Rob is well known to many of you. He's the Lloyd C. Nelson Professor of International Law at New York University School of Law. He's been uh, a long time a contributor to global debates on international investment law issues stemming from the early days of NAFTA's Chapter 11 uh, and um, frequently participates in uh, the arbitration process, either as a, a direct participant or as a, an observer and uh, critical an a analyst of the process. What we want to do uh, today, if I can get my slides moving, there we go. Um, Natalie will speak to the issue of the current state of play in the UNSA trial reform process, and Rob will then come in with a little bit of a critique of some of the issues and the scope of the issues that need to be addressed in terms of the reform, and then we hope to have a good half hour or more for questions and answers uh, before we wrap up. The seminar webinar will take an hour and 15 minutes uh, in total. Just as a brief introduction in terms of some of the issues for reform of the ISDS process, the investor state dispute settlement process, which UNSATRAL is engaged in, uh, just as a few introductory notes, uh, ISDS has essentially become the most frequently used international dispute settlement mechanism of all time. Uh, but at the same time, it's, I think, fair to say it's also become the most criticized international dispute settlement system of all time. There's over 800 known arbitrations by states against, uh, sorry, by investors against states. Um, the Awards are now reaching into billions of dollars with uh, almost unfettered discretion, if I can put it that way, of arbitrators to award lost profits well into the future. Um, the overall structure of the system is increasingly criticized. Arbitrators we see all too often taking on the role of legislator, not just interpreting or applying a treaty, but often going beyond that to define what, in their view, the treaty should have said, not what it did say. Um, we see conflicts of interest with law firms, arbitrators, and counsel, uh, arbitrators and counsel often wearing multiple hats. We see arbitrators coming from major law firms whose primary uh, regular business base is international uh, large um, investors. Uh, we see a number of inconsistent decisions, sometimes uh, what can really only be described as incoherent decisions, uh, especially in view of previous or, or other alternative approaches. There's no ability for the system to coalesce around a single standard of interpretation on key issues. There's a lack of effective oversight. Uh, in terms of review and appeal processes and so on. We're not going to discuss any of those issues in detail today. What we want to talk about today is the process for reform relating to some of those issues or, or many of those issues. So with that brief introduction, I'll pass directly 
uh, to Nat, pass the, the microphone directly to Natalie, who will update us on the current state of play in Uncitral and the upcoming meeting uh, next week in New York uh, relating to the reform process. So Natalie, over to you, please. Thanks, Howie. We're just uh, putting up the slides for the brief overview on the UNSI trial process uh, that uh, started last year. I wanted to just uh, provide a quick outline of what um, I will cover in my short intervention. Uh, I will first look briefly at the mandate that is given to Working Group 3 on the reform of investor state dispute settlement. We'll then briefly look at what happened in Vienna at the first Working Group 3 meeting in November, December last year. We'll look at what is to be expected in New York next week and then uh, we'll think a little bit about what will happen beyond, but then I won't say much because we uh, can go straight to Rob House, who will uh, be discussing those issues. Ancitral, in a way, is uh, the new kid on the block on investor uh, investment law and policy. And we know the traditional organizations working on investment law and policy are, of course, UNCTAD and also the OECD. Both organizations have done tremendous work on these issues, including on reform proposals and identifying problems with the current system. So because many are not so familiar with UNCITRAL, I thought I would just give a bit of background on the organization. Uh, it's the UN Commission on International Trade Law. It was established in 1966 to promote, as the title says, the progressive harmonization and unification of international trade law. This was very much uh, an expert group, media, uh, consisted very much of expert meetings uh, less political, perhaps, uh, than the current meeting that is taking place. The session of the commission uh, take place once annually, um, alternatively in New York and Vienna. And since 2004, the commission counts 60 members who are elected by the General Assembly for six years. And uh, before that, we had a smaller group of countries that constitute uh, constituted the Commission. The Commission is representative of geographic regions and major economic and legal systems. And this is very important because it shows that developing and emerging economies can have a quite important role uh, in this setting. It works, the Commission works through intergovernmental working groups that meet once or twice a year. And as we can see in this present process, it meets twice a year in Vienna and then in New York. And the decisions of the working group are typically taken by consensus and not by vote, although I'll come back to that. Non-member states, those that are not part of the 60 members, uh, they can still participate actively in the deliberations in the working groups and other stakeholders can also participate and take the floor. Here, we don't have the time to discuss, but the criteria for other stakeholders is less than clear. Um, and it's certainly something that we will have to discuss uh, more extensively uh, in another context. Then the mandate of uh, the, uh, the new mandate on investor state dispute settlement reform of UNCITRAL, how did we get there? It really started in 2015, 2016, when the Secretariat presented a report uh, to the Commission on the creation of a multilat multilateral or international tribunal for investor state dispute settlement. 
and alternatively, uh, or alternatively, an appeal mechanism for investor state uh, arbitration awards that would supplement the current ad hoc arbitration system. Interestingly, as an aside, this report was authored or lead, the lead of the report was Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler, who is one of the top arbitrators uh, in the field. And there was some uh, criticism about this to choose uh, someone who was really on the inside uh, to propose this, this uh, extensive reform uh, project. Uh, but we can't go into, into that right now. I just wanted to mention it. The mandate uh, was discussed in 2017, and it ultimately was uh, resulted in a broad mandate, but also uh, quite uh, timid. It, the working group uh, was entrusted with the following agenda it would first have to identify and consider concerns regarding investor state dispute settlement. It would then move on to considering whether reform was desirable uh, in relation to these concerns. And after that, in the third phase, the working group would uh, develop relevant solutions to be recommended to the commission in case uh, it was found that reform was desirable. The, it, it, it's quite important that many delegations insisted that the deliberations in the working group be government-led with high-level input from all governments. And this was stressed again and again because the makeup of these working groups is such that many government, governments in the past and even still now have been and are in part represented by, uh, by practitioners, by so-called experts, of course, uh, which, who are not government officials. This may make sense in other contexts uh, that are highly technical and not so politically charged as the reform of investor state dispute settlement. But in this case, there was an insistence of many delegations that the governments should be represented by government officials and therefore government-led and not industry-led, in this case, uh, by arbitration by arbitrators and uh, pra other practitioners from law firms. So we have looked at the mandate and we'll now pass on to what happened in Vienna. I want to start by saying that in Vienna, uh, in the working group meeting, it became quite clear that there was quite a divide in the perspectives amongst the members. This was already quite clear in the commission meetings in July, but they also became clear in the more technical discussions in November, December last year. And I would propose that there are three broad groups, although they're not that clearly delineated. One group uh, really doesn't want very much reform and wishes to tweak the investor state dispute settlement process through the bilateral or regional treaties, but not through a multilateral process. So this basically means that they're probably not that interested in resolving problems through UNCITRAL or anywhere else at the multilateral level. The next group uh, is, wants to work very much towards the creation of a multilateral investment court or an appeals mechanism or both uh, together. Of course, all of us know and are well aware that the EU counts to this uh, second group um, and uh, as an aside, this process was not originally started by the EU or even promoted by the EU in UNCITRA. They had, the EU had already begun a discussion on a multilateral investment court before UNCITRA took over uh, this, this area of concern or this idea. And so I just wanted to, 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 to um, 
mention that. But of course, uh, Euro the, Euro the, the Europeans are, or the EU is a very important uh, member of the second group uh, that uh, I mentioned here. The third group uh, is somewhere in between. They would like to use the UNCTAD trial process for a broader and more flexible reform at the multilateral level. So here, the ultimate idea from many of these uh, it is perhaps not at this stage uh, a multilateral court, but they are interested in multilateral solutions and also uh, thinking more creatively and perhaps beyond uh, ISDS uh, about reform. I want to just make two notes here. One is that in this first uh, working group session, the division between the countries, the divide between the different members led to the second vote only in Trials history. And this was about the nomination of the chair. I'm only mentioning this because typically, as I mentioned before, working group groups work with the consensus uh, on a consensus basis. And so this was a very important um, development. Um, and it may also show that uh, with this voting background in mind, developing countries and emerging economies really do have much lever leverage in this discussion. The second note I would like to make is that these discussions in Working Group 3 were audio recorded. And this is very different from a previous uh, process that had taken place earlier on the transparency of investor state dispute settlement where there was no audio recording and it was impossible to see or hear who was taking what stance so if you go to these three groups that i mentioned here we can clearly identify who fits where and we can come back to that in the discussion if if someone wishes then just a very brief overview of what was discussed in Vienna. The discussion is based on a paper, a working paper prepared by the Secretariat. And we have seen that the first stage of this mandate was to discuss the concerns. To some people, it may sound um, a little strange given that both UNCTAD and OECD have done very extensive work together also with governments highlighting these concerns. But nevertheless, this is what is being discussed now uh, in Vienna and was uh, in, in, in the process. And in Vienna, there were two uh, different elements that were to be discussed based on the paper. First, really the concerns in relation to the arbitral process. Second, the concerns relating to the arbitrators and the decision makers. In Vienna, they, the members went through the following points, following the structure of the Secretariat paper. They talked about the duration and the costs of investor state dispute settlement, the allocation of cost, the problem of third party funding, the lack of transparency, uh, they discussed the need for an early dismissal mechanism, the counterclaims and, and issues relating to them, as well as the coherence and consistency that Howie previously referred to. Uh, they left open uh, two issues that were briefly discussed. One was whether there should be a discussion about or the, whether the, the, the deliberations should extend to investor state dispute settlement under laws and contracts and not just treaties. And they also, the working group also left open whether other types of mechanisms uh, should, of ISDS mechanisms should be further examined. So in a way, uh, everything seems to be still on the table, even those issues that weren't specifically discussed in Vienna. One, again, I have two notes here. The first is that although the discussions were very much about 
these procedural issues that I listed before. What was interesting is to, was to see that the EU and also others pointed or linked these problems to more systemic and institutional problems and the fact that ad, the ad hoc nature of arbitration and the lack of a more permanent structure actually were inherent to the problems that were discussed. So that led to not only discuss, discussing procedural issues, but also led to questioning the more systemic and institutional issues. Um, the second point uh, was that there was recognition that it was very difficult or uh, to discuss only procedural issues and that the state of reforms of the substantive standards had to be kept in mind as the discussions went on. I just put here uh, for reference the documents that uh, will, what were the basis of the Vienna meeting. And then I would just like to go on to what we could expect from New York. Since the discussion of concerns was not uh, completed in Vienna, uh, this discussion will continue in New York and the issues that will be covered uh, will be the finality and re the, of awards and, and the review mechanisms. And then the group will move on to the concerns about the arbitrators, arbitrators and the decision makers. There is a possibility that discussions will take place, uh, that discussions moving on to into phase two will take place and there we would talk about the desirability of reform and perhaps that can't entirely be discussed without also looking at uh, possible solutions. But what is clear is that the the, the, we will continue to discuss the concerns and the discussion about the decision makers will surely be uh, quite uh, lively and interesting. And there's, there are still quite a few practitioners in the room uh, representing governments, so that will be interesting. Then just moving beyond it, this is my last slide, I, I think that we do, we cannot look at UNCITRAL and the UNCITRAL process in isolation, and we really need to keep uh, in mind what is happening elsewhere and how these interrelate. And I'm just thinking about what uh, the discussions in UNCTAD, OECD, even the WTO, and some of the human rights bodies, where, what is taking place there uh, cannot be uh, forgotten when discussing reform. Then also, uh, it's important to keep in mind the innovation and the alternative model, models that have been developed at the regional levels. And I'm thinking about the Southern African Development Community or the, uh, the uh, community on uh, Eastern and Southern African states, as well as Mercosur, where we have other types of approaches, including state-to-state -state dispute settlement, or using regional courts to settle disputes on investment. Clearly, we need to go beyond process, and this was something that came up in the discussions in Vienna, that we, we can't forget about the substantive rules and there, that there is a need to reform there, uh, those as well. And it's not only about the substantive standards that we know, but also the equilibrium between the rights and obligations of investors and states and so forth. And then, uh, of course, what I, I think I mentioned earlier is the need to uh, go beyond just discussing investor state dispute settlement and thinking about different models and uh, dispute settlement more broadly. Um, I think that if we think about the possible creation of a new mechanism, if that mechanism was just to replace investor state dispute settlement with a more permanent investor state dispute settlement without being more creative and thinking beyond uh, ISDS, I think that obviously would be a missed opportunity. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Natalie. Um, I need to find my slides again. There we go. Share screen. Hopefully. Okay. Hopefully this is working now. So thanks for those comments, Natalie, and we'll, we'll come back to a number of them. Uh, before Rob speaks, I just want to introduce some of his comments a little more broadly. A couple of weeks ago, Rob posted uh, a note on OJMID, the international listserv email service, um, that many of those of us who are engaged in the international arbitration issues uh, read on a regular basis, and he posted a copy of George Cahal III's lecture at Brooklyn Law School, the last uh, paragraph of which reads, and I'll just read it quickly, but it's important to go into uh, UNSA trial with eyes wide open and uh, to understand that there are serious problems that may not be solvable in the near future. UNSATRAL now has a working group to address ISDS with a mandate to identify and consider concerns, as Natalie just noted, uh, to consider whether reform is de desirable, and if so, to develop any relevant solutions to be recommended to the Commission. I'm not expecting meaningful reform anytime soon, and in fact, I wonder whether any reform might be a case of the cure being worse than the disease. That's especially true if, as appears to be the case, the main efforts at reform are directed not to questions of substance, but to the creation of institutions such as permanent investment courts and appeals tribunals that at this stage can be expected to build upon and institutionalize the serious flaws in the existing system. I think it is better to recognize that the system was poorly designed and has been malfunctioning for three decades and that dismantling it and starting from scratch is the wiser course. But that's a discussion for another day. So that day has come, or at least in part, and part of Rob's comments at least will address that very issue uh, that uh, George Cahal raised. Uh, in his lecture. So with that uh, introduction, Rob, I turn it over to you, please. Rob, you'll have to unmute. Okay, uh, how do I do that? You did. You're good now. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off by, um, if I may, uh, just reading to you a bit more from Mr. Cahale's uh, lecture uh, that Howard uh, just uh, cited, uh, because uh, uh, Cahale, who is chair of a major international law firm in, in New York, uh, came to investor state dispute settlement from uh, Wall Street corporate practice. So he came from a legal, a professional environment that you would hardly say would make him naive about um, the kinds of practices that occur in aggressive um, uh, litigation. And so uh, he, uh, he says, why do I call uh, ISDS the Wild West of international practice? First, because one can detect the trappings of a legal system in a real sense that all they are is trappings. There are no hard and fast rules, briefs, motions, oral arguments, discovery, and trials are all nothing like what you see in federal court. Briefs and arbitration can run into hundreds uh, of pages. Speculation and shoddy reporting in newspapers passes as evidence. Misrepresentation of fact and gross miscitations of authorities are rampant and when discovered, uh, usually go unpunished. Uh, uh, many of the players uh, in the game know and respect each other like the gunslingers of the wild, wild west and one can detect a certain unwritten code of conduct like lining up for the ceremonial handshakes. But a disciplined litigator used to proceedings right here in the Southern or Eastern District of New York is at a distinct disadvantage playing by the rules of conventional litigation when everyone else is in gloves off, anything goes mode. In one case, the main documents on which a billion dollar plus claim was based turned out to be forgeries. But the claimant still managed to avoid dismissal for about four years. In another, the key document evidencing the investment was also a fake. 
And if it were not for one of our associates figuring that out, because the phone number on the letterhead didn't even exist in that country at the time, no one would have known. Now, you might have thought both of these claims would have been thrown out immediately, but that's not how it works in ISDX. In fact, in the case of the phantom phone number, the claimant actually obtained the small award, showing that while forgery is not a good thing, it isn't necessarily fatal uh, to an ISDS claim. So uh, Mr. Cajal goes on and on, but uh, you get the idea that this is a system that's fundamentally broken uh, at the procedural level, uh, and therefore that um, there is uh, some real urgency to its reform. And the question is, uh, is uh, Uncetral uh, the place uh, uh, to undertake this urgent uh, exercise? Uh, I am very skeptical uh, about that, although perhaps a little less skeptical now than, um, let's say, a year ago, and that goes to some of uh, the achievements so far that Natalie has referred to, like moving the discussions into the third working group, which is not so much captured by commercial litigation or arbitration interests, and also the precedent that's been established for deciding by voting, which uh, prevents the holdout problem. But Uncentral is a place where nothing gets done, usually, uh, very fast. Um, and related to that is, some of the deep history as to how this issue got there. And that is connected to the desire, in, in, from what I can see, of some insiders who greatly profit out of the existing system, such as, for example, Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler, to basically find a black hole in which to throw, uh, you know, uh, ISDS uh, reform. And, um, it's to the credit of the states who actually want serious reform and through a multilateral process that they have tried to push Uncetral uh, into becoming a forum that's more um, uh, suited uh, to real reform rather than simply a place where the whole idea of reform can be parked and, and forgotten and business as usual uh, for uh, the kind of system that uh, I just described to you through the words of an experienced practitioner, uh, Cahill. So what can be done by reforming process itself? Who's the constituency for, for this kind of reform? One constituency is uh, you know, uh, litigators uh, like Mr. Cahill and people who think that if you have a justice system, it should be a real justice system. But that's frankly a small constituency. It is partly the reason I think that Cahill himself doesn't believe that this is going to go very far. The fact is the critics of the system uh, aren't that interested in procedural reform because they think it's foundations uh, are rotten. The idea that an international tribunal can basically chill uh, domestic regulation, limit uh, regulatory democracy, and so on, and that goes to the substantive norms and the very you know, idea of ISDS based upon uh, treaty provisions on uh, fair and equitable treatment, expropriation, um, and, and, and so on. On the other hand, the insiders don't really want reform at all. The few that pretend they want it uh, basically uh, have in mind the most minimal tweaking of the existing practices of ICSID or Uncetral uh, 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 arbitration. Um, so the idea of building a new multilateral judicial or quasi-judicial institution um, I'm not sure that uh, there's a big constituency for it. I don't see people marching in the street for it. And so, you know, what political capital is going to be ultimately put behind this kind of, um, uh, this kind of endeavor? And to achieve anything meaningful will, uh, in fact, require a fair amount of political capital uh, to be expended by those uh, states uh, who really uh, want the, uh, uh, the system uh, to change into something more like a normal uh, judicial uh, uh, system. Uh, so those are just opening observations. Um, you know, if one had real ambition 
for this exercise. Um, you know, what, I think that it is possible to address more of the problems with the system than some who are skeptical of a multilateral reform uh, might realize. For example, uh, jurisdictional clauses. You can use jurisdictional clauses to uh, eliminate um, practices under ISDS of jurisdiction expansion by arbitrators who are paid by the hour, such as using the most favored nation obligation to include the requirement the host state extend more favorable protection under treaties with third states than the treaty between the host state and the state in which the claimant is a national. That sort of a use of MFN uh, is unprecedented in international economic law. It never happened in the CAT or the WTF. Also, in the case of so-called umbrella clauses, general wording that a host state should honor all its commitments to the investor has been used by tribunals to take jurisdiction where the uh, investor and the host state actually agreed in a contract to a different forum, which might often be uh, the, uh, uh, the, the domestic courts of the host state. Well, if you have the proper jurisdictional clauses uh, in this new uh, system, uh, you can basically shut the door on these kinds of jurisdiction expanding uh, practices. Another problem is that the, uh, the damages awards are often outrageously large and inflated. You can cap the remedial jurisdiction uh, through uh, uh, the instrument for this new multilateral system. Either you can cap uh, the damages uh, uh, quantitatively, or you can specify that only in exceptional circumstances, monetary awards could exceed the proven losses of the claimant. And uh, economists like Joe Stiglitz uh, basically think that the existing approach to compensation is crazy. It, it, it creates moral hazard because you're fully compensating the investor as if they went on, for example, for expropriation they, and, and fair equal treatment, if they went on and successfully ran that business for 20 years, 30 years of the future. That's what you're, what you're paying them, not their losses. And, and so that can be shut down also through this multilateral uh, process by just saying that the tribunal doesn't have the jurisdiction to award damages that exceed uh, provable losses. Again, except in extraordinary circumstances where there might be egregious misconduct or the equivalent of a case for punitive damages in a domestic uh, legal, uh, legal system. Finally, to my mind, what, 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 is, what could really redeem this effort would be to give access to other stakeholders to international justice uh, in investment disputes. Why should only investors have access to such justice? Um, why not indigenous peoples, communities that are affected by environmental uh, uh, crimes uh, by corporations, and so on and so forth? Uh, if, we're, if, if we care about ISDS because we care about international justice, it can't be open solely to in investors. And there should be a possibility of counterclaims that uh, raise the issue as in, for example, the Urbrazer Ubra, and Argentina case, uh, and, and in a different way in, in the Black Creek uh, mining case, that the uh, investor's own conduct has contributed to the events uh, and, and the actions of the state that it's now complaining of. So we want, at a minimum, counterclaims, but also the possibility of other uh, stakeholders bringing, uh, bringing claims. It seems to me that this should be a litmus legitimacy test of this whole process, that it will generate a multi-stakeholder tribunal. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, I have lots of other observations about issues such as uh, enforcement, the qualifications of judges, uh, third-party funding. Uh, I see this as an opportunity to largely shut down third-party funding, which encourages vulture funds and speculators uh, to get into the picture and leads to more harassment and more claims against uh, states that are trying to regulate in the public interest. Uh, it should only be available uh, in the case of impecuniousness of a litigant and or if the dispute 
dispute is deemed uh, to, that, to be in the public interest that it be decided by the tribunal. But I'm, as I say, I'm gonna stop there. I look forward to questions, comments, and so forth. Thanks very much, Rob. Very interesting and some very challenging remarks. Uh, and let me, if I can, just um, go back also to Natalie's concluding comments and some of the points uh, you raised, Rob. Um, are, are we now getting to the point, I, I'll pose the question in a different way and then actually go directly to open the floor unless Rob or Natalie, you want to comment on it. Um, are, are we getting to the point where we need to really consolidate all of the variety of issues, negotiations, and quasi-negotiations going on at the multilateral level, whether it's investment facilitation at the WTO and those discussions, whether it's developing the um, the paradigm and the framework for investment for sustainable development that UNCTAD is involved with uh, or is leading in a more normative context, not a legal document, but certainly from a normative perspective, whether it's the kinds of issues being raised in UNCTRAL, the investor obligation issues being raised in the business and human rights context, in the UN Human Rights Committee negotiations, uh, do we perhaps need to be looking at how to consolidate these things rather than continue to have a, a growing number of fora that are addressing some of these issues? Uh, so that, it, to me, that that's perhaps a broader question, overarching kind of question uh, that overlays uh, a number of the issues that have been raised. So. Uh, Rob or Natalie, if you want to comment on that, you can chime in. Otherwise, we'll go into the, the questions. Um, I, I have a couple of comments uh, on that. Uh, one, uh, with respect to the WTO, um, I see as promising the idea of a, an investment facilitation agenda because I think it would be focused on um, improving governance and administration in a range of, of countries, uh, making uh, the legal regime to which the investor is subject more uh, transparent and so on, which could avoid disputes uh, and, and, and create a better, uh, more open relations between foreign investors and states. But uh, you know, uh, when uh, I had the chance to speak with the Director General of the WTO about just over a year ago, uh, Roberto Azevedo, I asked him, could this investment facilitation agenda grow into a larger agenda on investment at the WTO? And, uh, uh, and Ambassador Azevedo uh, suggested that there's still going to be a lot of pushback, and one can understand why, from a range of developing countries about bringing this in, because when, when uh, developed countries tried to bring it in in the past to the WTO, it was very much um, with a strong neoliberal uh, uh, agenda. So there's that, that baggage there that's, that's a problem. Um, the second issue with the WTO um, is, you know, it's a quote unquote member driven organization. It's very state, it remains very state centered. And I differ from some of the critics uh, of, of ISDS in that I don't think the answer is to return to a system that is only about the states. Uh, the one progressive thing uh, in ISDS is it does allow a non-state actor uh, to directly bring uh, a claim. And, and the problem is the only actor it allows to bring a claim is, is investors, and that generates a system where you have multi-million dollar uh, costs, uh, you know, uh, very expensive big law firms involved, um, arbitrators making a fortune, and so on. But still, I, I don't want to go back to the Westphalian world. I would rather go forward to a world in which many stakeholders can directly participate in, in, uh, in, in a, a system of settlement of investment disputes in accord with international justice, which just 
doesn't only mean, to my mind, the norms and investment treaties, but also human rights, corporate social responsibility, environmental norms, and so on. Okay, thanks very much, Rob. Natalie, any specific comments on this? Natalie? May need to unmute. Sorry, uh, we're just trying to unmute. Um, well, I, just because uh, Rob uh, mentioned a few issues also with respect to the WTO, a few comments. First, we do have this uh, process now in UNCITRAL, and we, we have to see what to make of it because to get a mandate in another organization to negotiate actually uh, a, a sort of a new um, a new way forward will will be hard to get somewhere else um, at the same time I, I don't think it's the ideal form at all uh, but the fact is we, we do have this opening if there is multiple form I, I in a way, ideally, there would be some place where all of these different processes could be brought together. Because if we're only talking about process here, and then we're talking about investment facilitation at the WTO, and then at UNCTAD and the World Investment Forum, we're going to be talking about reform options more generally, then how can we somehow uh, have a, 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 a an organization that has all, all, maybe a coordinating role that brings everything together. Because ultimately, we want uh, international investment law and policy to work towards achieving the sustainable development goals or sustainable development more generally. But what this piecemeal we have right now isn't really working in that direction. And my problem with the WTO is for sure it has some advantages, but the fact with the WTO of integrating sustainable development, in my view, that would be a very big challenge. And the fact is that the WTO doesn't, is not open. It works in isolation. It is more closed than the working group here in Ancitral, for example. Nobody can come in into the negotiating room except uh, the, the governments, not even other intergovernmental organizations have a right to really participate in WTO processes, except on some specially uh, accepted basis. So looking at, for example, uh, the in International Labor Organization, or looking at the UN environment, uh, uh, or looking at, um, well, any other UN organization perhaps working on, on human rights, they don't have access to, to the WTO and nobody can get into rooms. So I, I find that the idea of having the WTO look at investment from a sustainable development perspective, I would, I, I, I would be very worried about that. But I think there needs to be something that brings all these strands together so that we can really work on an agenda uh, to, to, to transform investment law and policy uh, into a vehicle to promoting sustainable investment. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, interestingly, or maybe not, maybe that's the, the um, more like-minded people, but uh, both comments actually go towards more role for international law in this area than less. Uh, the real question is how do we, how do we find a way to build that uh, in a way that's in more inclusive and representative? So with, with those initial questions, let me open the floor to uh, questions uh, or comments from everyone. In order to maximize the time we have, I would ask you to please uh, limit, keep your questions as short and to the point as possible. Uh, we have two means by which you can ask questions. One, if you go into the uh, ribbon at the top or bottom of your screen, you can get into the chat facility. It might be a chat box or it might be under the uh, heading of more. Uh, 
Uh, and if you click on the more box, you'll find the chat facility, or you can go into the box marked participants, and at the bottom of that box, you'll see a facility to raise your hand. Uh, and when you raise your hand, we can note that, and um, our colleague Stacy is taking, will take a list of who has raised their hand first, uh, and so on, so that we can get in as many questions. So if you have any questions, please do uh, signal either by raising your hand or by sending the question in via chat. Any, anybody? We're open now. I've got uh, Aminur Rahman. Yes. Please go Thank ahead. You. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I have been from Bangladesh. Thank you, Natalie and Robert House for your uh, nice deliberations. And from these deliberations, actually, I have been interested. Uh, and since I have been working with the uh, investment, international investment agreement procedures and uh, my accomplishment of those uh, investment agreements, actually, uh, my, uh, to be specific, I had a, um, a proposal that in the new process, uh, which you have been start, you have started uh, under the umbrella uh, guidelines of unsettled procedure to make an alternative of ISDS uh, disposal, uh, disposal system. Actually, I would request you to uh, find some way so that the developing countries can be able to fight the disputes, uh, particularly the governments, uh, be able to fight the uh, disputes put uh, abroad uh, by the investors in the develop, uh, these developed countries. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Natalie, any comments on that? And in the meantime, those who have questions, uh, please raise your hand or send them in by chat. Natalie, any comments on uh, Aminur's question or comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that I'm not sure whether um, whether you, I mean, you re re referred to the UNCITRA process or in general, and uh, that it should be geared more towards uh, d uh, sustainable development, but also taking into account the position of developing countries uh, more specifically. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, investors are just having worked with many countries uh, over the years, I have seen that, I mean, investor state dispute settlement, uh, the way it is uh, constructed now has, has really raised, uh, or has been extremely challenging for developing countries. And obviously it, for the discussions at UNCITRAL, this has to be kept in mind. Now there are some um, initiatives that, have been floated to create an advisory center or perhaps to support developing countries financially um, when they face claims. But to me, that is really, um, you know, using a Band-Aid to fix a broken leg or something like that, because it, it's, it's almost, um, it, it doesn't solve any of the problems and it just, postpones maybe the push for reform, which is what some may wish to see who are proposing uh, these, uh, these types of uh, remedies. Um, and of course, for a developing country, for example, for Uruguay, when uh, Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg at, at the time actually s supported through his NGO, the defense of the claim brought by Philip Morris, this was a good thing for Uruguay, but to institutionalize uh, financial support for developing countries as a 
way to fix the system. I, for that, for me, is an example of a, a, a reform that would be uh, not very useful and certainly not uh, very effective in the long run. And so I think that we have to think about these reforms in terms of the developing countries. Each of the reform options has to be seen in the light of, of developing countries. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Uh, we've got one question by chat. So for others, please don't be shy to either raise your hand in the participants box or send in a question by chat. Uh, the question that we have now um, is, uh, is there a time frame that we can expect for the UNSA trial process? So I think we need to look at that question in terms of the different phases you outlined, Natalie, and maybe you can uh, take a stab at that. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, exactly how, I mean, it, it's hard to know how long it, it would take. Um, Rob mentioned how long these processes ha have been seen to take in the past. Um, if there is a, a return to voting, which I'm, I'm, I don't know if there is a precedence, but since uh, there was a, a vote that took place in, in Vienna, if this, this is used again, it obviously could sp speed up some of the, some of the decision making, although I don't know wh whether it would go that way. Um, if if more voting does take place, uh, the, the role of developing countries in pushing uh, forward would, would be even greater. But even if there's consensus, if developing countries and emerging economies are quite um, active, then uh, the process might be um, expedited a little bit. But in general, I mean, it would take several years. And so this is a very important question uh, because even if the reform process, we don't know what the outcome would be, but even if it were something that came out of it that would fix some of the, or address some of the concerns of developing countries, um, to have it actually implemented and have uh, countries sign on to this reform would take time beyond the process. So for example, you know, there's this convention that was negotiated in the UNCTRAL um, uh, a few years ago, and uh, even as of now, we only have three uh, countries that have signed the convention. So, even if you have an outcome in UNCTRAL, it doesn't mean that it's going to be effective immediately. So, I think what countries have to think about, if they're really facing problems with investor state dispute settlement and the system, they should consider whether they should, there should be some kind of moratorium or there, ha there should be a discussion what happens uh, in this, during this time that there is a discussion in UNCTRAL and until the reform, if there is one, uh, reform uh, solution is put into practice. And so I don't think what, countries should stop reforming their own uh, treaties, finding solutions, thinking about uh, a moratoria in some cases, moratoria in some cases. Um, and so that is kind of a discussion um, I didn't think we would discuss here, but uh, I hope that answers a little bit. So it will take a long time. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Uh, let me just put some concrete numbers to, if I can, to what Natalie said. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, Natalie and, and I were two of the original uh, advocates for the transparency regime in UNCTRAL. Uh, it wasn't actually on their agenda to do that until uh, Natalie and myself, when Natalie was at uh, the Center for International Environment Law and myself through ISD, uh, effectively put it on the agenda back in 2006 or 2007. Um, the Mauritius Convention was signed in 2013, I believe, and we still have only a small number of states that are party to that, meaning that the actual, actual effect of the Mauritius Convention in terms of uh, legally changing global practice on transparency uh, for the existing 28 or 2900 investment treaties uh, 
uh, has been very, very small, and that's 10 or 12 years later. Uh, so in terms of looking at uh, the rate of change that UNCITRAL has produced of actual legal change, um, uh, in terms of generating new rules, it's been, uh, took about six or seven years in terms of those rules impacting pre-existing investment treaties, which is what the type of mechanism they're looking at now might need to do, uh, we still see very little uptake. Um, okay. can, can I uh, say something uh, on this? Yep, and then let, let me just read one other question first, if I can, or comment first, and then come back to you, Rob, to comment on okay. Uh, so the a comment from uh, Samuel Tru Trujillo, um, I personally think that predicting a concrete time frame is difficult because of the interest in the UNSA trial room. The red block led by the U.S. wants to stall the process in the blue block. Canada and the EU want to proceed as fast as possible, even if that means steamrolling over the concerns of developing countries, a point Natalie just highlighted uh, as well. Um, and then another comment that's just come in uh, from Stella Obita, assuming there is a move to a multilateral investment system, isn't there a need uh, to include investor obligations in investment contracts with states? So a, a different take on that. So Rob, your first comment, and then we can come to Stella's if we can. Uh, yes, on on the time frame, uh, there's a French expression that I like a great deal, uh, au calendre grec, um, uh, which I guess roughly translated would be don't hold your breath or um, uh, something like that. Um, and what I really wanted to reinforce is, is, is Natalie's message that the last thing would, would, one would want would be um, for you know, the UNCITRAL process to be a kind of placebo or pacifier that would that would somehow make less urgent um, uh, states moving away from the existing system um, and taking actions on their own or through new bilateral negotiations to dismantle it as much as, as possible. And just to give you one recent example, South Africa, has made a fairly dramatic move away from uh, ISDS and BITS towards a domestic legal framework for investment. And even though uh, South Africa was threatened that no new investment would come to it if it did that, in fact, investment is up in South Africa, foreign investment, including a multi-billion dollar investment, I, I was just told on the weekend by a South African a judge, uh, worth uh, several billion, uh, billion dollars. Um, in the United States, the Trump administration is largely opposed to ISDS for its own uh, sovereignist type uh, reasons. Um, but it seems to me that it, in, in America, one could well get um, a coalition of Republican and Democratic senators and Congress people who will block ISDS in the future. Some of them from a more conservative sovereignist perspective, others like Elizabeth Warren from a progressive uh, perspective. In the EU, there's been important litigation uh, that relates to ISDS and, and, and still another case to come, at least one from the European Court of Justice that really, I think, will make it very complicated, uh, even if the EU wanted to do a U-turn and go back to uh, the old regime, to even have that in a manner compatible with EU law as interpreted by the Court of Justice. So with the US and the EU probably on the cusp of dramatically moving away from this system if we're optimistic, and countries like South Africa making dramatic moves uh, away from it uh, too, there's a lot of dynamism out there. And, and we want to keep that dynamism and intensify it. And that's why when you're looking at what goes on in UNCITRAL, keep your checklist of everything that is pathological about the existing system and see just how much of that is really being discussed there. And I think one will be powerfully reminded that these uh, dynamics uh, of the reconsideration of BITS and ISDS uh, in, uh, at the domestic level 
um, are, uh, are enormously important and need to continue full tilt regardless of what happens at Uncitral. Good, thanks Rob. Uh, Natalie, I'm gonna ask you to comment quickly on two questions and then we'll come back to Stella's comment because uh, Stella's comment actually raises the issue of the scope of change that needs to be considered. So we'll go first to the other two questions by uh, Bart Jap, uh, Jap Van uh, Verbeek uh, and Oladiapo uh, Fabu Fabiusui. Sorry, I'm not wearing my glasses to read the screen. I should be. Uh, why do the ISDS reform discussions take place in working group three, whereas the transparency rules were in working group two? What were the political motivations behind this? Um, and second, is the ICSIT secretariat involved in the ongoing reform proposals, uh, given its role, and uh, perhaps we might add here, given its own uh, revision process underway? So maybe, Natalie, you could take a, a quick uh, look at those two and then we'll have leave ourselves two or three or four minutes to address the other question from Stella um, I, I do want to say I think we have some people from um, the from the World Bank I mean from the from uh, exit um, on, on the call so if they want to uh, respond that would be an option as well on on the working group um, I think I don't know if I'm exactly right but what I understand from some of the discussions is that working group three uh, was open <laughs> in the sense that they had nothing on the agenda that was urgent uh, and also it was uh, quite soon after the commission meeting in July and there were some members and you can think uh, the EU uh, Canada wanted to uh, really begin this process as soon as possible so I think that a lot of it uh, a lot of the sort of reasons behind working group two uh, three uh, were related to those logistical kinds of um, issues but at the same time I do think there was also um, satisfaction about the how working group three is constituted as compared to the working group on arbitration um, which w is more dominated by uh, practitioners who of course have a stake in the current um, ISDS system and then on exit um, I, I Perhaps someone wants to double up from the ICSID secretariat, but here I can just say that ICSID has made uh, a few submissions to the to, to the working group. I think um, ICSID has to think about what uh, they wish to. <laughs> there's just a, 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 a. I think there's just a response here. Um, I think ICSID has to think about what role they would play if there was a move towards a more permanent system and whether this could be somehow housed in, in, in ICSID. Um, and at the same time, um, looking at the reform process taking place in is ICSID is, uh, what I have seen, it's quite timid. Uh, smaller uh, tweaks here and there, I didn't see any real uh, very far-reaching um, reforms on the agenda there. But I haven't looked at the process recently, so I may be missing something. Okay, with uh, thanks very much, Natalie. So, with respect to ICSID, uh, we'll include the comment from Damon uh, to the link that um, of, of the discussion of re the reform process by Meg Kinnear, who's ICSID's Secretary General. Damon Viss Dunbar has provided a link in the chat. And maybe, Stacy, we can make sure that link is included in the final materials we send around to everybody, uh, the summary and the link to the uh, recording and so on. So thanks very much for that, Damon. Uh, let, let's conclude, I think, by going back to the question from uh, Stella Obita. Assuming there is a move to a multilateral investment system, isn't there a need to include investor obligations in investment contracts with states? And I think, uh, first I would suggest that th the second part of that ought to be broadened, not just is there a need to include investor obligations 
an investment contract with states, but is there a need to include investor obligations in the investment treaties in order to achieve a more balanced result? And then if one does have this set of obligations, is there a need to provide better enforcement mechanisms at the international level, not just between states and investors, in other words, reversing investor state to state to investor also, but also as both Rob and Natalie mentioned earlier, opening that up to other stakeholders who may be damaged in the international investment process, whether that's um, environmental damage, uh, community level damage, human rights breaches, and so on. So if I can ask perhaps uh, Natalie first and then Rob in a minute or a minute and a half each to, to comment on that, and then uh, we'll be past time and should wrap up. So Natalie first, please. Howie, uh, if I may, um, can I, since we have very little time and I've spoken a lot, if I could leave this to, to Rob uh, sure. so he has an additional minute, if that's okay. Sure. Rob, over to you. Um, well, uh, at this point, um, I'm not sure that I have um, a lot more to say. I might only slightly um, uh, uh, disagree with um, Natalie's reaction to the idea of litigation assistance for um, uh, developing countries. Um, um, there is a program that was launched by the, the UN and is housed in the IDLO in Rome uh, to provide assistance to least developing countries. And uh, to my mind, it's still you know, worth doing. It is a band-aid, but it's not an alternative uh, to the kinds of reform dynamics we've been talking about. And it also includes assistance to negotiate and renegotiate uh, uh, treaties and uh, uh, investment contracts. So uh, I think that is uh, actually contributing positively to the dynamics rather than somehow giving the impression that um, everything would be okay if, 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 um, if developing or at least developing countries had the resources to defend uh, against um, uh, against claims. Uh, I would also say that I'm very happy to, um, you know, take further questions or comments. Uh, you 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 can easily find me on Twitter and and tweet to me. Um, some of what I've said may may seem technical, uh, so I'm happy to get follow ups and and to clarify through that means uh, anything uh, that's come up. Okay. Thanks very much, Rob, and for that. Um, and, and of course, for all of the participants who want to send in additional questions or comments, you have the uh, email connections uh, to do that, and we can circulate uh, both the questions or comments and any replies from the speakers to them to everyone that way. Uh, so with that, let me conclude. Uh, Thank every first thanks to, to Natalie uh, and Joe uh, and Stacy Como from our team for organizing uh, this webinar, which we hope is the first in a series. We we plan to do four or five of them a year over the next couple of years, uh, and hope we can build this as as a consistent uh, and steady process. Uh, and we'll see if we can tweak the. Uh, software that we use or figure out a little, little different software perhaps to get more visual contact with those who are speaking as well. Um, but uh, a special thanks of course to Natalie and Rob for their uh, comments and uh, thoughtful responses to the questions that have been asked and to all of you for uh, joining us uh, whether it's this morning, this afternoon, or this evening depending on where you are. Thank you very much for joining us. We will send around all of the links and follow-up information. Uh, and um, so with that, uh, we'll declare ourselves closed for today uh, and look forward to reconvening again before too long. I, and yes, in response to this final comment, we will send the link to the George Cah uh, Cahill's lectures as well. Thanks very much. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, we'll Thank you.
conference here and uh, look to uh, reconvene in, in uh, about two months. Thanks for- Thank you. Bye -bye.